Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to another reading wrap up. You can tell that it's summer now because at any given moment at least one of my neighbors is mowing their lawn very loudly. Right now it's two of them and I would usually wait because I don't like having distracting noise when I'm filming but I know that as soon as they're done somebody else will start and I just, you know, need to get this done. <laughs> I hope it doesn't pick up on camera. I know a lot of stuff doesn't, but I can hear it and it drives me crazy sometimes. Anyway, let's talk about books and then maybe I'll talk a little bit about using that floor loom that I assembled two weeks ago. <laughs> I had grand plans for April actually and then none of it really happened. I was going to like take all my books back to the library and only read from my physical TBR and then none of that basically happened. I just it was one of the worst reading months I've had in quite a while and by that I mean I just didn't read that much. I didn't feel like reading a lot of the time and uh, what I did read though was interesting and good so yay but um, my plans to read a bunch of books from my physical TBR completely fell through. I finished finished one. One in the entire month. So <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to start off by talking about two books I don't completely understand and uh, what I have to say about them will probably be a garbled mess, but I I'm going to try. So first up is Assassin of Reality by Marina and Sergei Diachenko. I buddy read this with Rhea from The Book Finch. Um, Assassin of Reality is a direct sequel to Vida Nostra, which came out in English a couple of years ago. And Rhea and I had also buddy read that, which is why we said, well, let's read the sequel together. And we really enjoyed Vida Nostra. It was such an experience reading that. And I, I really liked it. I really enjoyed the end of it. And I expected Assassin of Reality to be more of the same. I did not quite realize it was a direct sequel though. I didn't think that that existed. Um, so long story short, Vida Nostra I believe originally was the first of a thematic trilogy, but the other two books have never been translated into English, and Assassin of Reality was very recently written and published. So it is new and it's the beginning of like maybe a new direct trilogy from the same first book. I don't know. I think my main issue with this book is that um, it felt like it was kind of repeating what Vida Nostra did, but it wasn't as atmospheric, it wasn't as engrossing and mysterious and powerful as the first book. And I also felt like just the existence of the story kind of negated the impact of what I took away from the ending of Vida Nostra. Because it's basically like, not to be too spoilery, it's kind of, hey, you failed the exam gotta take it over again. And I was like, but I didn't realize anybody had failed the exam. Huh? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I just didn't quite understand why this should exist. It wasn't bad. In fact, I found that when I was reading it, I was very engrossed in it. I was trying to figure it out and it just pulled me right along. But I didn't think that the language of it was as rich and wonderful as in Vida Nostra. And it just didn't hit me in the same way. I, I think it was, it's still like highly metaphorical and it's this type of metaphor that I take very literally. I keep trying to approach the story as a pretty literal like fantasy novel and it's, it's more than that, but I have a hard time um, kind of cracking the code of that metaphor. And it's a good thing I've been reading it with Rhea because um, they have explained some things to me that I did not pick up on. <laughs> So this was basically an okay experience. I am glad that I tried reading it, but I have to say I'm way more interested in any of those um, thematic sequels to Vita Nostra rather than this direct sequel. And then we have The Dragon Waiting by John M. Ford, which I have to say I did um, understand more of what was happening in this plot-wise, um, but this is another buddy read where I was so glad I had somebody to talk to um, while I was reading it. So um, I read my first John M. Ford novel a little while ago, uh, Growing Up Weightless, and I buddy read it with uh, Joe from Final Blow Joe. I did a whole review of that and it was a very interesting read. It really got me thinking, especially after I had finished the book of like, like what, what was that experience about? What was so good about that but very understated? So we decided to continue and buddy read The Dragon Waiting as well. And this is a fantasy novel. It's actually a World Fantasy Award winner, uh, whereas um, Growing Up Weightless is a pretty slim sci-fi novel. And 
I, how to summarize this? I don't think you can summarize this without leaving out at least one really important detail. It is basically an, a fantastical alternate history of Europe and Britain where uh, Byzantium continues on, like the Byzantine Empire continues on and is a major driving force, um, like conquering parts of Europe. And in the beginning of the story, um, we're in um, the Italian states, which are coming under attack from Byzantium. There's, you know, Lorenzo de' Medici, the Magnificent, and characters like that in here. And then Byzantium is essentially coming for Britain next, or for England and Wales and Scotland and such. And the characters of this, it's this group of roughly four people who maybe sort of meet by chance at an inn in the Swiss Alps and decide to join together to go to England and do something. Um, the back of the book um, says that together they will wage an intrigue-filled campaign against the might of Byzantium to secure the English throne for Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and make him Richard III. Except that is a, that's very direct. I'm not sure that any of the characters, except maybe for Hul, um, had that in mind. So alternate history, fantastical retelling of the Byzantium Empire and the end of the War of the Rose Roses and the Princes in the Tower and Richard III, and there's so much going on in this. It's like, what if European history was changed by the existence of vampires and also wizards are real, but magic is like very low key? Um, did I mention before that I thought this was going to become a garbled mess? There's so much going on in here. And so I think plot-wise, um, I could grasp some of the um, historical influences, this kind of being a time period that I know a bit about. Um, but I think I missed so many of the subtleties of the... Um, I guess like the, the social issues, the political intrigue in this, because the world, there's so much world building. It's so richly described and imagined, but as in growing up weightless, none of it is explained. And I struggle with that a lot more in this book because um, it made the story, like the actual plot, the action, characters' motivations, decision making and stuff, it was so opaque. I couldn't figure out why people were behaving the way that they were or why they were reacting the way that they were because I didn't understand the forces of, of the surrounding context, you know? Um, so I just did a lot of guesswork while reading this. And it was rewarding. I think my main takeaway from this is that it stuck with me. I, I really like felt for the characters by the end for whatever reason. I got to the end of the book and was like, but wait, I think I would like one more chapter to find out what happens to Cynthia. <laughs> um, I wanted there to be more. It stuck in my brain in that way. Like it was a really sticky kind of story. Um, and I think that it's that kind of story that rereading it is when you really see the magnificence of it. Um, there's just too much to pick up on the first time around. Um, you spend all this time trying to figure out just like the basics of what's happening and you miss the subtleties, or at least that that's my idea here. Um, so this definitely goes on the list of novels that my, my immediate impression is I would love this even more if I were to actually reread it. <laughs> How often do I reread things? Very, very rarely. Um, but it is that kind of novel, I think. So I enjoyed it and I'm very glad that I had Joe to talk to about it because um, it was nice to be able to bounce ideas off of him and not be alone and saying, I'm very confused, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Next up, I read The Rose in Versailles, Omnibus 5 by Ryoka Ikeda. I had said when I finished the main story with volume four that I wasn't gonna continue on with this last collection because um, it's just like side stories and, and not really related to the main story of this manga series. Well, um, I read it anyway. <laughs> Because um, the local librarian who handles like all the um, 
interlibrary loan requests um, often notices that I'm reading like all of the volumes in a particular series and so every once in a while she just requests the next one for me like I don't submit the request she just gets it for me and that's what happened with this one so it just showed up at the library one day and I was like okay I guess I'm reading that and I'm glad that I did so this is a collection of um, stories involving Oscar and her niece who is this crazy character introduced at the end of the main story. Uh, she's this very precocious little girl who is constantly getting herself into um, difficult situations and investigating mysteries and such. And it is so much fluffy, harebrained fun. Um, so I enjoyed this quite a bit as just brain candy. I actually liked it a lot more than the last volume of the main story, maybe because it, it wasn't about, you know, like everybody dying in the French Revolution, but whatever. <laughs> so I am glad that I actually got the chance to read this and it was just a nice palette cleanser. Next up is The Bachelor's Valet by Arden Powell. This is a queer, slightly fantasy romance set in the 1920s. And let, let's just say, if you ever wanted a very queer, very gay, fluffy, romantic piece of fan fiction about Jeeves and Wooster, um, have I got the book for you. <laughs> now, I'm not saying this is actually a fanfic, but that is definitely the character types in this. Um, the point of view character is Alphonse. He is um, the you know son of a rich family. He's kind of one of those idle um, rich kids of the 1920s, bright young things I think they were called. Um, he is very pretty and dumb. <laughs> and he has the most sunshiny, amiable personality. And that makes up a lot of the fluffiness and happiness of this book is that he is, um, he just goes along for the ride. <laughs> um, and he has a valet named Jacoby, who is uh, absolutely Jeeves. And yeah, they like each other. <laughs> Um, it also has like a whole lavender marriage plot to it. Um, Alphonse's mother wants him to get married. She arranges this whole thing for him to meet um, a, a woman, Jasmine. They don't really have uh, a say in this matter, but it turns out that marrying each other is, um, it, it furthers both of their interests and then lets Alphonse, you know, actually dig into his feelings for Jacoby and discussions about, you know, um, consent and getting into romantic relationships with um, one's staff. <laughs> like that, that is not swept under the rug, it's actually addressed. So this was delightful. I read the entire thing in a single evening, in a single sitting, and I wanted more. I've actually started another book in the series and I'm hoping that it's pretty much the same thing. I forget the name of the book, oh god, I'm terrible. It sounds like it's gonna be a polyamorous romance from the 1920s and I am here for it. So super, super enjoyed The Bachelor's Valet, and I would definitely recommend it if you want something that is a historical romance, very queer, and very happy, because it, it made me just delighted while I was reading it. <laughs> And um, so segueing from that to this next book is not going to be easy because I read Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law by Mary Roach. And this is a nonfiction book that came out a couple of years ago, um, which in, in Mary Roach's typical fashion, she goes out talking to people, interviewing, investigating um, stories and just instances of something kind of wacky. And in this case, it is what happens when wildlife meets human society and human laws. What happens when animals are just doing their thing, but it irritates or annoys or gets in the way of human activity. And this was very interesting. It was actually a bit different from what I had expected, probably because even though it, it's um, humorous, um, my takeaway from it was actually that it's very sad because so much of this book is summed up at the very end when, when Mary Roach says that pretty much everything she's talked about, all these situations with, you know, bears getting into people's houses and people having trouble with squirrels and mice and everything, is that it's a problem of our own making. Wildlife, animals, everything, they're just going about their own business. We are in their way and we go out of our way to do horrible things to wildlife because they inconvenience us. And that, that was 
really hard to read sometimes. I was listening to this audiobook while doing other things and I was like, wow, this sounds like it's gonna be a really fun book, but because it's about how humans treat animals, it's dark sometimes and I wasn't really expecting that. It's probably because of this topic that it hit me differently, like on a slightly different emotional level and I think maybe it kind of affected Mary Roach a bit differently as well and the people that she was talking to. Um, yeah, I just it was very different from some of the more um, light-hearted material <laughs> that Roach has talked about before. It's not quite the same as like gulp and the digestive system or bonk and stuff about sex or whatever. Um, so yeah, but I did enjoy it and I did I do really appreciate Mary Roach's sense of humor for whatever reason. So um, it, it was a good read. And that is everything that I've managed to finish recently, and the rest of my time has been spent um, working on crafting projects. And the last week or so, I have been really intensively working on my first ever weaving project, which is an extremely long sampler. <laughs> So if you don't know, um, a couple of weeks ago, I finally got and assembled my four shaft floor loom. Um, so it's a pretty big loom and you can do relatively complex designs on it. And um, I finally warped it for the first time, made so many mistakes, and I have a very, very long sampler, mainly like twill variations, I think. So a lot of fun and I learned a lot, but um, my gosh, Weaving projects are so time consuming. I spent an entire weekend, like two days, just trying to warp the loom. Like there was no weaving happening, just setting up the project. So that's what I've been doing. But anyway, very fun. And now that I've done a sampler and kind of figured some stuff out on my loom, I'm ready to um, pick the next little practice project. So we'll see what I do next. But anyway, that is me, and I'm hoping that um, this coming month, I mean, tomorrow is May, um, I will actually read and finish some things that I wanted to get around to. I don't know what was going on with me in April, but I'd like to focus more on actually getting through books in May. That will make me happy. <laughs> So let me know what you have been reading, what have you been doing, and I will talk to you soon, and until then, bye.